Good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to this worship service this morning. We pray that as we worship the Lord together, we will be strengthened by his word and spirit and that we will all be um, encouraged through it. Um, next Sunday is Christmas morning and we will have worship service at 9 o'clock and you're welcome to invite your friends and families and neighbours and anyone else to join us for that Christmas Day service. Thank you. Marty's going to lead us this morning. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from Luke's Gospel, from a familiar song of Mary, the mother of Jesus, where we read, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, let us pause in a moment of silent and personal prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can gather together as your people to worship your name here this morning. We're so grateful that we can do this in freedom. We pray, Lord, as we've all had busy weeks and our minds and our hearts may be burdened, that you would help us to be prepared to hear from your word, to sing your praises and to respond in a way that brings you glory and so that your name may be great. And Father, as we have all fallen short of your glory as well throughout this week, we pray that you would forgive us and cleanse us and continue to shape us to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the assurance of pardon from our great God in Isaiah chapter 66. Be joyful over Jerusalem and rejoice for her. All you who love her, be exceedingly glad with her, all you who mourn over her. For this is what the Lord says. Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you will be nursed, you will be carried on the hip, and rocked back and forth on the knees. As the one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Praise God. Brothers and sisters, let's stand together and sing that famous hymn, Tell Out My Soul, based on that great song of praise by Mary. Let us sing.
Our first Bible reading this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Brothers and sisters, I chose this scripture this morning for the Ministry of Reconciliation for two reasons. And the first reason is sometimes we read the Bible and it's a little bit difficult to understand. And there's one particular phrase by the Scottish preacher Alistair Begg which I find really helpful in understanding the Bible as a whole. So let me share it with you. Alistair Begg says, The book is a, bi- is a, a Bible is a book about Jesus. In the Old Testament, he is predicted. In the Gospels, he is revealed. In the Acts, he is preached. In the Epistles, he is explained. Oops. And in the Revelation, he is expected. Sorry about that. So as I was reading this text this morning for our sermon, and there's this last verse, verse 5 and 6, which sort of sticks out, And like, what is that talking about? When the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses, we will raise up against them seven shepherds and even eight commanders who will rule the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod with drawn sword. He will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land. Now, another great preacher, Bill Wiersma, said something as well that was very helpful last week. When we were going through the prophecy of Jeremiah, he said, things were written in a way that the people would have understood. And so, yes, God will deliver Judah for a time from the Assyrians, but there is an even greater delivery through Christ. So as we read in this passage that Christ gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So just how the people of Judah had shepherds put over them underneath their great king, so too the Lord has provided apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to serve under him, leading and equipping God's people for service 
so that may, we all may mat attain maturity and fullness in him. What a great God who fulfills the promises that he makes. And the second reason that I chose this is because this has been a very different year for our church. We haven't had a full-time pastor, and yet we've had pastors in the elders, um, shepherds of God's people under our great shepherd king, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to thank my fellow elders for the work that they've done this year in serving the people here faithfully. And I also want to thank everyone here because it's not just the elders that are the shepherds. We all play our part. As the word says, every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We've just been so encouraged and grateful by the way that everyone has served, prayed, encouraged and ministered to one another in this past year. And we're looking forward with eager hope and anticipation in what next year will involve with Pastor Andrew DeVries and his family serving amongst us. So let us pray and give thanks for the way that God has worked amongst us this year. He is the head through whom we all serve. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we serve under this great and mighty shepherd king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that you include us in the work of building your kingdom. We're thankful that it is one spirit and one Lord whom we serve. And we thank you that by that spirit you enable us to love and to serve and to minister to one another. So we give you great thanks for the year that's been and the way that which you've preserved us, the way that which you've grown us and encouraged us by your word and by each other. And we pray that you would continue your work here in our church in Toowoomba as you build your kingdom here. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's stand again and sing two songs, O Little Town of Bethlehem and The Lord is My Shepherd, as we prepare to hear from God's word in Micah 5. Let us sing.
I now invite John to continue reading God's word and lead us in prayer. Congregation, congregation, let's bow then in prayer before God. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are our shepherd. You are the one who leads us and guides us through each day of the week. Every moment, Lord, when we lay our heads down on our pillows at night, you are there and taking care. And for that, Father, we just give you thanks and praise. We know that we have a loving Heavenly Father who really cares. Lord, we pray this, this morning for our brother Yako Clarsen, first of all. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Yako, that you would be his comfort and his strength. Lord, we pray for Petro and the family as they struggle at this time when Yako is either you're going to heal him or he's going to be with you. One way or the other, his time is coming near. And Lord, we pray that you will indeed take charge of that situation, that your Holy Spirit would be in that family's midst just to comfort and strengthen them. Lord, we want to pray this morning also for our church family. We thank you for your wonderful provision for us day in and day out, that you help us in our time of need, but you also provide us in our time of joy and thankfulness. And Lord, out of that provision of yours that you give us our daily work and that you enable us to be healthy and strong to do that, and Lord, that we receive our wages when we do. And Lord, we thank you for that and we pray that as we return some of that to you, that you would bless the work of the deacons, you would bless the work of the church treasurer and Lord, help us each one to provide for our church family in that way. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a generous God to us Help us then to be generous to others as well. We pray for our compassion child, the one that we support. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with us as we support that child. May we lay aside a portion and help that person as well. Father, we think of the compassion guide that we have and, and where the church is raising money for the needy. Lord, may we be looking that way and seeking out ways in which we too, through your generosity, are able to help others. Our Heavenly Father, we just pray for others who are ill and sick at this time. We do pray that uh, your hand will be with them and that they may find strength in you. We give you thanks, Lord, for those who have been sick and who have had um, surgery and other things and that you have been their guide and you have uh, renewed them, given them recovery. Lord, we praise you for that and we know you are a generous God in that way. And Lord, it brings us to mind about our sister Re uh, Regina Vendrimlin as uh, she also has been diagnosed with it cancer of the blood. Be with Regina and Tony, Lord. We are sad that um, they can't be with us next week, but we know why. And, and Lord, all these things happen in your good time. So we pray that you'd be with them and that our prayers may be go, go with them as well. We think of others. Lord, we pray this morning for your healing hand to be with each one of us for we each one are sick in a different way we are sick with sin and and lord we know that we need to turn to you for recovery for renewal and we thank you for your holy spirit that renews us and we thank you for your word that encourages us Heavenly Father, we want to pray for the DeVries family at this time as they have their annual holidays and we thank you that they have arrived in Australia. We thank you that they are re getting, becoming refreshed 
through their holidays and that they would be ready, that Andrew especially would be ready to serve here as your pastor, as our under-shepherd with the elders. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen him and guide him. Lord, be with us also as we prepare a home for them. And we thank you that for the many volunteers that we've had to help prepare that house so that they would be welcome in it. Lord, we pray that you give us strength and keep us safe as we do our daily work, wherever that may be. Heavenly Father, and as we some of us are going on holidays and many are on holidays at this time, we pray for them. We pray for our holiday time that it may not be a time that we move away from you and go out to enjoy ourselves, but we enjoy ourselves with you, rejoicing in your goodness to us that we can even have holidays. And so, Father, we just pray that your hand will be with us, that you would look after us, and we especially pray for the children as they uh, have their holidays, that it, they too may enjoy their holidays, but do it safely. Our Lord our God, we pray for Marty now as he will lead us in worship, in, in your word. We ask that you'll strengthen and guide him in that. May our hearts be encouraged. May our souls be uh, renewed and that we may find that when your word is applied to our lives, we are able to live lives with greater joy and happiness. So, Lord, we pray that you'll be with us, be with Marty, and that the Holy Spirit would be in, your, in our midst in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'd like to read to you from Matthew... And it's chapter 1, and it's the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Re Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jeho Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Isia. Isia, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of jo Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah, the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Elkim, Elkim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zodak, Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Ehud. Ehud, the father of Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of Matham. Matham, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, 
who is called who is called the Messiah. Thus there were fourteen generations in all from Abram to David, fourteen from David to the, the exile to Babylon, and fourteen from the exile to the Messiah. So ends the wording. Thank you, John. Before we hear again from God's word, let us sing Ancient of Days. Please stand. for leading us so well in song. So this morning our sermon text comes from the prophecy of Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem of Hephra, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you one will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. When the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses, when we will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders, who rule the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod with the drawn sword. He will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders. Now one thing 
that I really look forward to in the holidays is being able to do things that I don't seem to have much time to do throughout the rest of the year. I'm sure we all have one of those pastimes that we enjoy when we're not at our day jobs or running around doing errands. For some of you it might be gardening, for others it might be sewing or embroidery or mosaics. And I also suspect that hiking and fishing would be high on the list for many in our church. Although my favourite pastime is a little bit dull in comparison to these. It is reading a book. Boring as it may seem to others, I love spending hours on end reading novels in the summertime while sipping icy cold drinks. In fact, some of my best memories are doing this in a hammock at my grandparents' beach house. And so, I would actually encourage everyone to have a go at reading a book if it's not a regular habit of yours already. Because we live in a world where modern entertainment is constantly shortening our attention spans, whereas a TikTok now has a maximum of one minute is all they're allowed to show. So the discipline of being able to find joy in reading a book from cover to cover and finding meaning can be priceless. Especially, brothers and sisters, when we apply that same discipline to the very word of God in the scriptures. And many of you won't be surprised when I say that I reread one of my favourite books over the holidays. And it is, of course, by J.R.R. Tolkien. And it is, of course, The Lord of the Rings. And it's an allegory of the gospel, brothers and sisters, in this most famous epic where we see a parallel for our text in the sermon this morning. You see, this world that Tolkien created, Middle Earth, was actually created in perfection, in beauty and wonder, and yet has become full of evil, corruption and death. It is a dangerous place to live. Sound familiar? Even the grandest of cities of men, Minas Tirith, is under siege and their ruler is powerless to defend them. This man, this caretaker for the throne, Denethor, has fallen into despair and he refuses to even rally his own troops to the city's defence, let alone call on his allies for help. This kingdom is afraid. They are desperate for a powerful and courageous leader, a man who can defeat their enemies and bring them peace. And there's only one man that fits this description in all of Middle Earth, who can stand up to the evil, who has the fortitude to destroy what threatens all the good in the world. His name is Aragorn, the only living heir of a great royal line. You see, the people of Middle-earth are crying out. They are desperate. They are awaiting the return of the king. And as I mentioned, this story, this epic novel, is an allegory of an even greater and eternal spiritual reality. That is the proclamation of Jesus Christ as God's promised ruler and saviour of the world. So let's look at this wonderful prophecy in Micah and what it has to tell us about Jesus, the Lord of lords and King of kings. And as we work our way through this text, we'll look at three key points. Firstly, the need for a king. Second, the promise of a king. And thirdly, the return of the king. Let us begin. And so as we read, our passage today begins with a very dire situation for God's people. We see that Israel's kings have failed. The prophet Micah here is speaking to the nation of Judah, Israel's southern kingdom. And his message couldn't be clearer. That is, get ready for a fight. Your enemies are laying siege against you, as we read in the first half of verse 1. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. And given this period of history, we are in no doubt as to who this foreign power is that is laying siege against Judah. It is the great and awesome Assyrian Empire. 
So what has gone wrong for Israel here? The chosen people of God are being oppressed in the very land that God has promised them as their inheritance. What has happened? Are these Assyrians so powerful that God is unable to protect his people? And where is the king? Where is the heir of David who is supposed to lead and guide the people of Israel? Well, as we read on, we see that even he will be utterly humiliated. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. Judah's king will be brought low, utterly vulnerable, utterly broken and defenseless, such that his enemies will be able to strike him on the cheek and he will not have any strength or power to retaliate. The king of Judah has failed to govern and protect his people. And yet the truth is that his failure goes far deeper than the humiliation that he receives from his enemies. You see, the confronting truth for the rulers and for the prophets of Judah is that the nation will be conquered and oppressed because of their moral failure. And this shouldn't be a surprise if we've read Micah's prophecy and other prophets before him who have been warning God's people to turn away from their evil ways, to turn back to the Lord, to follow his laws, his commandments. And yet for the most part of history, the people of Israel, especially their kings, can be summarised as a downward spiral of moral decline. In chapter 3 of Micah, just previous, we read that the prophets love evil, and they hate good. And we read that the rulers detest justice and they readily accept any bribe that's offered to them. They become altogether corrupt. It is written that they build Zion with blood. Nobody is safe. These prophets and rulers were supposed to lead and protect God's people and lead them in the knowledge of the Lord to uphold justice and righteousness in the land amongst God's chosen and precious people. And yet they have failed, and they have failed miserably. And through the prophet Micah, we know that the rulers themselves are culpable. They are responsible for the coming destruction, as we read in chapter 3. Therefore, on account of you, speaking to Judah's rulers, Zion will be ploughed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. Now fast forward nearly two and a half thousand years to the modern day. Surely we're more enlightened, aren't we? We're more civilised in our Western culture nowhere near as barbaric and corrupt as these ancient rulers of Judah. Unfortunately, this is not the case. So don't get too comfortable here when we look back at Israel, because the leaders of modern nations are no more righteous than they were. You only need to look around the world to see the conflict and turmoil to know that the moral failure of leaders today is still prevalent. And that's a picture of the war in Ukraine. But even here in Australia, though we are not at war in open conflict, we murder thousands of people every year for the sake of convenience. And we murder these people while they are vulnerable in their mother's womb. But again, don't get too comfortable. Because we've looked at Israel's leaders and seen their moral failure. And we can look at the leaders around us today and shake our head and complain about their moral failure. And yet the word of God speaks to our hearts and commands us to dis examine ourselves to discover 
our moral failure, or as the Bible calls it, our sin. We have failed. Now the Hebrew word for sin can be literally translated as missing the mark. And so if you compare all of humanity to, say, an archer, we haven't even come close to the target, let alone hit the bullseye of perfect worship and obedience that God demands and requires of us as a holy and perfect God. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul holds up a mirror to the human race and he shows us from throughout the scriptures just how serious and prevalent our sin is. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. The Apostle Paul goes on with even more graphic descriptions of our sin, which he summarises in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if this isn't confronting enough, our sin actually makes us God's enemies. When we rebel against his rule with our sin, we are at enmity with our God and with our creator. A terrifying position to be in. And yet God is merciful and he has a solution to this predicament. The solution is in fact a person, which brings us to our second point this morning, the promise of a king. And as we look at the promise of the king, we'll consider where will he come from, who has he come from, and when will he come So looking at verse 2, we see what probably would have been an unusual statement to the original readers, although today we're like, yeah, obvious, this is what happens. But we read, But you, Bethlehem Epaphra, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me the one who will be ruler over Israel. A mighty king who would, on behalf of God himself, be ruler in Israel. This bloke, this mighty king, would come from Bethlehem. Bethlehem? To the modern reader, we're like, of course, that's where the Messiah was born. We sing, O little town of Bethlehem. And while this may be true and obvious to us, it may have been incomprehensible to the Jews who had lived under many generations of kings being born in the luxury and prestige of the palace in Jerusalem. But O oh, little town of Bethlehem is but nothing in comparison to Jerusalem. As the text clearly says, it is too little even to be named among the clans of Judah. And that's correct. When we read chapter 1 of Micah's prophecy and we see all the judgments on the cities of Judah, Bethlehem is not mentioned anywhere. It would be like saying all the towns of Toowoomba, that a king would come out of a little place called Rosalie Plains, population 44. Now, I was going to use Southbrook as an example, but I decided not to. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying that Rosalie Plains or Southbrook is in any way inferior to the other towns of our region. However, it is very, very small compared to all the other cities on the map. In fact, on most maps, it's not there. You really have to zoom in to find it. But like Rosalie Plains, this little town of Bethlehem, despite being insignificant, in size and influence. What we would say today is that it has sentimental value. In fact, we know from Israel's history that one of the greatest kings was born and bred 
in this part of the world. And from 1 Samuel chapter 16, we get a clear indication of who this king has come from. The Lord said to Samuel the prophet, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. He goes to Jesse from Bethlehem and subsequently finds King David himself. This same king that the prophet Nathan spoke to, saying, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so we see this prophecy of this little town of Bethlehem is very exciting news. After so many generations of David's offspring, the people of Israel may have started to doubt God's promise of an eternal king sitting on David's throne especially when they looked at the track record that they could see of his offspring, 14 generations that for the most part failed to love and serve the Lord. And yet we see the grace and mercy of God in remembering his promise to David. Despite the great moral failure of his offspring, God is keeping his promise. And from the second half of verse 2 in Micah 5, we read that God is now going back to where it all began. This king will have origins who are from old, from ancient times. Now on face value, this verse is a little confusing. What does it mean? Is it the ancient of days that we just sang about? And how far back are we supposed to be going in our thinking when we hear the phrase, from ancient times. Well, again, it's about the context and what it meant to the people to which it was written. So in that context, we can likely infer that this is a reference to ages past, or in this instance, the ages of David, drawing people's attention away from Jerusalem, back to where it all began, to where and through God's promises all began and when will this king come when will this great king arrive the text gives us a somewhat cryptic answer in verse 3 we read therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites now we might look at this and think that we are looking forward to the nativity story recorded in Matthew and Luke's gospel accounts when we see the phrase, she who is in labor bears a son, as referring to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was indeed in labor in Bethlehem and gave birth to our Lord. And yet the text has a much broader and deeper meaning by the word she here in the text. For you see, quite often in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is personified as a she, sometimes as a daughter, other times as a bride. Hence, the prophet Micah here is describing a period of time in which God will abandon or give up his people to judgment and exile, scattering them among the nations. Yet, in his mercy, he will preserve a faithful remnant of his people and return them to their promised land. And we know from the genealogy of Christ that we read from Matthew's Gospel that there were 14 generations without a ruler in the land. If we were to use a modern analogy from medieval Europe, we would say that this is the dark ages of Israel. No king and presumably no hope. But through the prophecy of Micah, God's prophet, there is hope for the future. 
even though the people of Israel will feel like they are in the pains of labour as they wait for their Saviour to come, as they await for their long-returning King. And what will this King look like? What can we expect of his reign? Well, to be honest, it's not something that we would anticipate of a mighty ruler as we read in the text. In fact, the way that this king is described is completely unorthodox. From verse 4, we see that this great one to come will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Shepherd his flock. This everlasting and mighty ruler who will sit on David's throne will be like a lowly shepherd. And to understand just how outrageous this statement is, we need to know just how common and lowly the profession of a shepherd was in ancient times. Now, to use a British example, back in 2004, the comedian Tony Robinson, who you may know from Black Adder, hosted a show titled The Worst Jobs in History. And he did an episode of the worst rural jobs in history. And lo and behold, the shepherd was first on the list. Now, while this show is based on a British experience, let's be honest, sheep are sheep. They don't change much from continent to continent and they need the same care no matter where they are. And it is a dirty, it is a smelly, and it is a thankless job. I mean, you have to wipe their backsides for them so that they don't get flies and die. And you rarely get a chance to even wash yourself and having a day off, forget about it, there's no public holidays or long service leave for a shepherd. All because the shepherd must care for and protect and lead his sheep at all costs. And this is the promised eternal king that is described. He is described as a humble and lowly shepherd standing and shepherding his flock in the strength and majesty of God himself. But it really flips our ideas of power and might on its head, doesn't it? That true power and glory are found in loving and serving and leading and protecting others, which is precisely what God's king will do when he returns to Israel. It's a challenging view of power and might that we're not used to seeing. Because this king, this eternal ruler on David's throne, has every right to rule with all power and authority, with an iron scepter over his subjects. And yet, he sees his people as humble and vulnerable sheep that need to be protected and cared for as we read on from the second half of verse 4. This, because of this king, they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Do you see the security on a truly global scale that this shepherd king brings? These people, these sheep of God's flock, which have been scattered throughout the entire world, they are now gathered back to their homeland and will remain in safety because of the greatness of their king. But more importantly, he will be our peace. Do you notice the subtlety in that phrase? It's not that this king will bring peace. It's not that he will help advocate for peace, like someone sitting on the Security Council in the United Nations or in Parliament. No, he will be our peace.
peace. And what exactly does that mean? Or remember that terrifying reality that in our natural state as sinners that we are enemies of God, as we read in Romans 13. All humanity, the Jews, God's chosen people, the Gentiles, everyone else, including you and me, all fall short of the glory of God. We have missed the mark. We are enemies of God. How can we have peace? Because as a consequence of our sin, we rightly must face the righteous judgment and punishment of God. The Bible calls this hell. But don't despair. This is why the prophecy of Micah is such good news to the world. You see, our promised king will not only bring us peace with God himself, but he will be our peace. And like the promised birth of God's ruler in the town of Bethlehem, God's promise of peace has been perfectly fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. As the great and mighty shepherd king, Jesus brings us peace by making the ultimate sacrifice for his people, his beloved sheep. By his death on the cross, he has made a way for our sin to be forgiven. Jew or Gentile, we can now have peace with God by trusting in the death of Jesus on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins. Remember how the New Testament letters explain Christ, the Christ that is predicted in the Old Testament. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes our peace with God and each other in his letter to the Ephesians. We read, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, Jew and Gentile, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. How incredible is this, brothers and sisters, that our great Lord and Shepherd King, Jesus Christ, is our peace. That in the cross, in his death on our behalf, we have been reconciled to God and to each other. This is the heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus coming into the world. That God's eternal and mighty king was also a humble shepherd who died for his flock to be their peace. What a wonderful, loving, merciful and gracious God we serve. And now as we conclude, let us consider some ways in which we can apply this text in our lives. Firstly, do you submit to the king? It's a simple but important question. You may have heard God's word many times, sat in church on many Sundays. But being in church and hearing the word will not save you or bring you peace with God. The Bible is clear that only by believing and submitting to God's King, the Lord Jesus Christ, you will receive forgiveness and life in his name. Only then will he be your peace. For whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So if this is not a decision that you have made in your life today, then I urge you to respond in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess that you are a sinner and an enemy of God and put your faith in Jesus' death on your behalf and receive the promises of eternal life and peace with God himself because Jesus is our peace. 
And one day, as we sang, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Secondly, if Jesus is your king, we see an example in the text today to wait faithfully because we know that Jesus will return. And like the faithful remnant of Israel, we are called as God's people to stand firm in his word against the trials of the world, persevering and trusting in the goodness of God's word and his goodness to us in Jesus, our peace. We read that blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. We live amongst the crooked and depraved generation. We know this. And so we wait faithfully for Jesus' return, persevering under trial. And just as God began the work in us, he himself is able to powerfully work to complete it. As we read, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May you, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait faithfully and trust in God's spirit to persevere you, to preserve you as we wait. And lastly, what do we do while we wait? While we build the kingdom, we continue God's work here on earth. You see, God chooses to involve us in his plan of salvation. And like the prophecy in Micah, he is raising up shepherds and generals to protect the nation of Israel. So we too must trust him to protect the church from error and fulfill our calling as servants in his kingdom. Listen to the wonderful identity that we have as God's chosen people. But we, that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy mercy we are to boldly proclaim the glory of god in christ while we wait for his return and brothers and sisters what a better time to do that than this time of year when so many people are desperate to know the christ in christmas for themselves to know that he can be their peace so that many may believe in him as well and be called out of their darkness into his wonderful light so that they may find their peace with God in our Lord and Shepherd King, Jesus Christ. Let us pray and give thanks. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word this morning for the way in which you have acted throughout the history of redemption of your people, for the way in which, even though we don't deserve your goodness and your mercy, you preserved a remnant throughout your people Israel so that you may bring forth your promised shepherd king into the world, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are a loving, kind and generous God, not lording it over us as you have the right to do, but humbly leading us as, your sh as our shepherd and our king, protecting us, preserving us. So we pray now that as we wait for your return, that you would help us to live godly and holy lives. Help us to live in expectation that you will return and help us to be bold in proclaiming your gospel to the world so that others may know that you can be their peace. And we thank you, Lord, that despite our sin, that you love us and that in Christ you are our peace and that we can be reconciled to you 
and receive these promises of eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're going to sing one last song. Hark the herald angels sing. As we sing this, meditate on the wonderful words of the gospel. It is truly my favourite carol just because of the rich theology and just the marvel that we sing of Jesus in this song. So please be encouraged. <coughs> Please remain standing for the benediction of the Lord from Galatians chapter 1. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.